Thank you very much, Sarah Jane. Uh, we do have two microphones in the audience. Uh, if you have a question, we have about 15 minutes of questions for, uh, for our first panel. Uh, I guess uh, as you uh, think about a question you want to ask, uh, I could ask one question. So we're two days away from inauguration here. Uh, there's one positive thing. Yes, I did say positive thing. Uh, you expect from a Trump-Pence presidency administration, what would that be? Let's be positive for just a few seconds. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> I actually don't see anything positive about this at all. So I can't. I, there's there is not one thing that I think is positive about this administration. They anger me. So it, nothing. Okay. Is I, I, mean, I, I mean, I think some people have hoped that Trump would be impeached. Okay, and some people have actually argued that for the Republicans, like why would Republicans uh, support somebody such as Trump, you know, with his, shall we say, uh, uh, compromised moral history, right? But uh, many people thinking that basically Mike Pence is waiting in the wings. Uh, he's uh, but he's an ideologue, he's, he's an incredible ideologue, right? Uh, who is, as has been pointed out, is worse, and in fact is one of these people who believes the Flintstones is a scientific documentary. <laughs> okay? I think one positive thing is not with the administration, <laughs> is the outpouring of opposition. Okay, and I think, uh, like for example, let's take the African American community, let's take uh, other communities as well, in the sense that under Obama, and this was a prediction I made, I was not a supporter of Obama. Obama, uh, I understood, being, of, um, being black myself, the kind of emotional power that was invested in him after years of degradation, right? When he was elected, but he was obviously a neoliberal. He's obviously the head of, a, in my opinion, as a Marxist, uh, the most powerful imperialist state, a state um, with incredible levels of inequality. And I predict that one of, the, one of the things would happen is a lot of people would go to sleep. And this happened in the African American community. So a lot of people are mobilized in opposition. And I think this is a positive thing. Where that goes in terms of people being organized, and this is the question you raised, uh, the time-honored affliction, uh, preoccupation, game of the left is obviously to engage in sectarian uh, fights among themselves, right? Everyone is, in the, everyone is defending, no matter if you're a group circle of one person, and if you're one person, you must have multiple personality split because they always see it has to be a split, okay? That even though you're de defining the doctrinal, the doctrinal Tr uh, doctrinal truth, right? That's all that matters. So one of the key points is people organizing. And I think this is what we see, this outpouring of opposition that I showed in my slide, I think is a very important development. Any other takers? No? no, no? Okay. So we have a question. My question's for Mary. Yes. Could you tell me, Mary, you said your last, your closing question, your closing statement, the industry is ready. Were you referring to the research industry or the transportation industry? Actually, I'm referring to both. The research uh, community is um, uh, a little aghast at the outcome that wasn't quite what they expected, but they see that there's opportunities. Every time something looks really bad, they see an opportunity that arises from it to move on and to look uh, in a different direction. So they're starting already to coalesce around the ideas that maybe they should be looking at things they haven't looked at because it didn't, pol wasn't politically expedient to, to, to gain enough traction to move forward. The transportation industry is saying, wait a minute, maybe there actually might be some dollars thrown at something that was worthwhile because we have Trump, we have a Congress, and we have a Senate that are all lined up. <coughs> Um, the other thing is, is that um, they're ready because they believe that this is a, um, a positive in that, that there hasn't been that kind of alignment um, before. And they're counting on the fact that Congress will keep Trump in line. They sort of feel like Trump will play the, the, the um, mediator role. So there's a lot more faith in, in positive attitude, even though they were absolutely shocked that it didn't go the way it was anticipated to have gone. Thank you all. I enjoyed it. Thank you for your question. Next question. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, so in a recent Senate hearing, James Comey would not answer if the FBI is currently investigating ties between Russia and Trump. 
If the FBI is, what do you think are the chances, chances of impeachment are? <laughs> Wishful thinking? So the, the question is, if the FBI is investigating, what are the chances that he'll be impeached specifically about that? Yeah. Okay. So this is important because I've already got money down on him being impeached for three um, Is that the money you lost on the Hillary no, no. Clinton? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, what are the chances he'll be impeached? I would, I'd say pretty close to zero on that one. I think uh, because there's different kinds of things you can be impeached on, and it's, an impeachment is mostly a political thing. It rarely actually plays itself out on, we can clearly identify that you broke this rule, and that's, it's really mostly, the impeachment mechanism is sort of, uh, um, you know, we caught you dead to rights on something bad, and now we're gonna put pressure on you to essentially resign before you hit the wall. Um, and I think because whatever would be involved would be classified information, and they, they wouldn't be able to put it out in the public eye, it'd never work as a mechanism for that political sort of pushing him out kind of thing. And, unless there's actually the, the kind of information that'd be required to build a case against him for treason, which seems very unlikely to me, that they're not gonna be ever able to translate this into an impeachment. Other things, maybe that. I think actually that if you read between the lines about what's happened in the last 48 hours, I think it's very clear the FBI is investigating him, oh, yeah. Yeah. just based yeah. on the Democratic reaction to their interview with Comey. So yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, so this is for uh, Sarah Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke earlier about uh, fact-resistant people, basically. Uh, with that new age coming, uh, with Trump's election in the United States and the threat of now two people in the conservative elect, uh, party running for office that want to take up that Trump mantle, what does the left have to do to organize against this new breed of regressive politics? Well, actually, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a new breed, and I don't think that this is something that's new. I mean, postmodernism has been around for a long time. I mean, uh, there is a biography of Bill Clinton that's actually called the postmodern president, you know, the argument, you know, you know um, what was that, uh, we don't know what is, is, right? That whole idea, and if you look at the um, George W. Bush administration, they had an interesting relationship with facts and truth as well. So um, I, think for, I think, as I suggested, that the left really needs to come together in a way that they haven't since the 1960s. And I think Trump gives us um, the equivalent of the Vietnam War, if you will. Uh, because a lot of people, whether it be uh, women, whether it be LGBT, uh, whether it be um, African Americans, whether it be um, people of Islamic f uh, faith, um, we are all terrified by this president. So I, I, think, I think he prov uh, provides a cause belli. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, hi, so a little along the same lines of uh, ignorance of facts is, and I don't see it as much along the kind of liberal conservative divide, right, left, because of course there are people within the Repu American Republican Party or Canadian Conservative Party um, who are fighting the same battle against people within their own party who are willing to uh, campaign and uh, have this discourse on things that aren't true or can't be verified. Um, and so how do you think, not just the left, but anyone who feels uh, a need to stick to facts <laughs> um, starts to combat that and get people's attention as much as people like Trump who just say outrageous things do? Uh, how do we get people's attention as much with the truth and start to succeed against that? I think you're just blowing in the wind. I mean, if you look at, um, Obama's been president for eight years now. 70% of Trump supporters still think he wasn't born in the United States. Uh, if you poll Trump voters, um, you look at the stock market, the stock market has gone up, right? Trump voters, it's gone down. You look at unemployment figures, which have gone down under Obama. According to Trump voters, they've gone up. So to say that the only way we can move forward is to agree on a set of facts, I don't think that matters anymore. Anybody else, else? Yeah. on facts? Thank you very much. Next question. 
Hi, it's a question for everyone. Um, so we've been hearing since the Democratic Convention about uh, possibly the Russians being involved with Trump or ha and hacking and releasing information they shouldn't be releasing. And now there's also saying the media has been saying that the FSB has information on Trump. Trump, do you think that this? Um, everyone thinks that this is a way that the Russians were trying to get a man that they thought they could get along with. But do you think maybe this was? more of a plan to cause internal fractures in the United States so they would stop focusing on the world, focus on themselves so they can become, so Russia can become a new dominant power over, or the more, um, a more dominant power over Europe and more dominant power in the Middle East. Hmm. Right? Something like that, yeah. I mean, I, my, my, I, we, we don't know for sure, um, but my guess is that the Russians had no particular ambition to engineer a particular outcome so much as that they hoped to sabotage Clinton, cause discord in American politics. Uh, and they've done similar kinds of things uh, with countries in Western Europe as well, where the plan's not necessarily to, you know, this is our Manchurian candidate person and we're gonna kind of get them in place. Uh, it's more like, we're going to cause trouble there. Anything we can do to create tension within NATO and to uh, essentially weaken the West creates more space for us uh, to do what we want to do in our part of the world. And, there, and it's not so much because I, I think they have any ambition at world domination so much as that they have felt over the last 10 or 15 years hard pressed by the West, even in their own backyard. And I think the expectation is if there's some fracturing of NATO or of the West more generally, then that will ease that pressure and allow them to, to be less uh, subjected to domestic political criticism and, and criticism in terms of their managing of what they call the near abroad of the former Soviet state. If I, I may just quickly say, I just think it's, uh, um, you know, what's happened with the Brexit, what's happened with these contradictions between Russia and the United States, I think it demonstrates the uh, the instability that ex that's growing in on the world. And I think it's really interesting that the U.S. Uh, basically arrogates to itself the right to intervene in so many elections and yeah. um, so many countries. And it's surprised that uh, other countries would actually perhaps intervene in their own electoral process, right? So it's very interesting how uh, they've arrogated that right to themselves. I mean, what was Yeltsin? But nothing but a U.S. agent in many ways. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Next question. Hi, um, my question is primarily for Dr. Cork, although I think everyone is um, situated to, to talk about it. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak at all to what becomes of um, universities under the Trump presidency, um, specifically as it relates to either funding or accessibility to documents. Um, is, and the reason why I'm addressing it to Dr. Cork is because you talk about um, the postmodernist sort of retreat into the university and as like a locus for more left-leaning thought whether or not that is going to be affected um, with Trump as president. Well, what we're seeing in the states, and I can't remember the exact uh, name, but there's actually now student organizations being set up this, in the states to actually uh, keep lists of dangerous mm. professors, professors, right? Professors that um, may say anything that is not considered um, politically correct. So or actually, it's the reverse of, reverse of that, if you're, if you're saying things that are too politically correct. So again, I think American universities are at a dangerous place. So I don't know what the solution is. I really don't. So thanks, Sam. Amal? But let, let's not conflate the situation in the US with the situation here. Richard, I hear enrollment is up in, on Canadian campuses, right? After the Trump presidency, so. Is that benefit? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Trump. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next question. Hi, this is kind of for everyone as professors, as researchers, and as students. And it's pretty similar to the questions about universities. Living in a postmodern world where <coughs> facts aren't really facts anymore, do you think that research will change? Will it move to a more qualitative research than quantitative? And how will that change You know, access to documents and facts in the future? Hmm. I think it already has changed. I mean, the way historians write about the past has fundamentally changed, I think, in the last 30 or 40 years. But historians are always going to rely on documents. Mm. Emma? Just, uh, I, mean, I mean, I agree with everything my colleagues are saying, but since what I do is, you know, Middle Eastern studies, this whole thing about facts is, is, is an old issue there in a way. We've been talking about facts in the Middle <coughs> East for a long time. Nobody cares. So it's like a revenge moment in the Middle East kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mary. Um, 
I have quite a different perspective. Um, given, given the amount of time I spent uh, in the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and working with the Council, Canadian, Council of Canadian Academies, I've, I've realized that what happens is those who are in the um, role of doing research that is uh, produced as uh, something, uh, a report at that level, are actually going above and beyond on the peer review. They're using more peer reviewers, they're doing more fact checking, they're being more careful to address, they're tightening up the procedures, they're making it more and more and more difficult to make the document um, attackable. So, so on one side, we, we're seeing things you know, deteriorate, and on the other side, the ones who feel it is their role to hold up the standard are getting tighter. Thank you, Mary. Next question. Hi. Uh, so this is kind of a question just for anyone. Um, so when following the election, uh, one thing I kind of noticed was this weird kind of phenomenon on both sides where uh, on the Republican side, you see a lot of like the big major players, they're saying like, don't vote for Trump, maybe not in so many words, um, but then the voters come out and they're just kind of blindly following him or even voting as a joke. I've seen a lot, um, but then on the Democratic side, you have a lot of people being like, this is the best choice you have in Hillary, this is one that you need to go for, and then people are kind of saying like, no, she's not the one I wanted, I'm going to like write my vote, it's kind of like a s form of self-expression voting. So I was kind of just wondering how this like, if you have any opinions about this weird phenomena that kind of happens and how um, just the two different sides and like the weird way they kind of choose their votes. Um, yeah. Um, I think there's, there's also a certain amount of noise in every vote where a certain percentage of people vote e either just for the hell of it or they, you know, they, um, <laughs> I don't know, they write state puff marshal mail man is in the right, ca right in Canada or whatever it is. Um, and I, I, there may have been more of that this year than in other, in other elections and that may have been at least partly because there was sort of a general conventional wisdom in big chunks of the United States that obviously Hillary is going to win and you don't need to go out and vote. My, my hunch is that if that made a big difference to the outcome, it wasn't so much in terms of encouraging spoiled ballots or any of that kind of thing. It was more about the demobilizing voters who felt like they didn't have to show up to the polls because the outcome was sort of already settled. Uh, and you know, there have been some studies that show that that, that that did take place, especially in bigger urban areas, especially in some of parts of the Midwest where um, it just misunderstood how close the vote was likely to be and, and stayed at home. I don't know if that gets at what you were asking. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think one thing, sort of add something quickly here, is people will be diagnosing this for a very, very long time, right, as they do the research. One of the things that's come out, it seems very prosaic, right, and very simple, was that she was cutting costs, right? And there were some people, that the, the Democratic organization that Obama had was very well organized to get the vote out. And there were people who had not even been paid, okay? There were people where they didn't even have the money, right, to get the vote out, right? So because she was interested in cutting the cost, and whether she thought she could cut the cost because she thought she was a, a shoe-in, that's another debate that's going to unfold. So there's some very broad, you know, uh, philosophical and political arguments we can make, and then there's simple, simple ones like this, that they, she didn't have the organization properly funded and organized on the ground to get the vote out. All right, uh, one last question for panel number one. Uh, my name is Ashley. Uh, I'm gonna try to frame this as a question. Um, a few people have asked what the left can do to sort of push back against uh, what's happening. Um, it seems to me that it's at least fairly obvious that a lot of people in America um, were left behind by the Democratic Party and were ignored. And it doesn't seem to me it's that the left has to come together so much as the left has to reach out to the people that are being ignored. So I guess my question is, um, is, it, is it that the left um, needs to come together or is it that the left uh, needs to reach out, um, I guess is, is my question. Um, Okay, All right. It doesn't seem obvious to me that it's just that they need to come together. What should the left do? Um, 
Well, I think you've sort of, you're touching on sort of the big political question for the Democratic Party right now. Do, does the Democratic Party do as Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden want them to do, is to go into the Midwest and court these um, white middle class voters who apparently um, were not making enough money um, under Obama? Or do they continue to appeal to those uh, who formed the Obama uh, coalition? Uh, I hope they do the latter. Um, people say that um, these white middle-class men and women in the, from the Midwest who said that they, uh, they voted for Trump for economic reasons, I think they voted for him because of greed. Because people were actually, um, the lives of lower middle-class Americans under Obama was getting better. The only people that, um, that were economically not doing as well as they should have were those white middle class voters in the Midwest. I think under Hillary Clinton, um, the gains would have continued. Um, and I think, uh, I don't think the Democratic Party needs to court people that would vote for a homophobic, Islamophobic, misogynist candidate. Yeah. That's my thought. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Isaac. There's going to be a lot. I mean, I've been reading all the blogs, all the discussions. There's going to be huge debates on this, right? And on the left, there's a debate where there's two cla two things that have emerged. One is that what that what the left has lacked, or is a class analysis, right? Okay, of a capitalism. Um, and I found that two reductions, right? There's some who basically are denying, and I know that um, AJ is going to address this on the second panel, the issue of race, and particularly white supremacy, right? So the intersection of race and class, right, are going to be, and gender, are going to be very important areas of discussion, right? And, um, you know, you read one set of so data on why people voted all these surveys, and it says, well, it's because, uh, you know, the, the, the Democratic coalition didn't come out enough. Then you say, well, no, it's because the white worker in class, right, shifted their vote. And you hear different um, sets of data and so forth. This is going to be a big debate that goes on for quite a while. The issue about the Democratic Party is like the Republican Party. I mean, it's like, you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, right, different wings of the same party. Both of them are tied to the financial oligarchy, right? And this is going to be a very, very important question. Now, ultimately, the argument I think that's essential is building uh, independent politics, right? That's going to be essential because both the Democrats and the Republicans have both been war, um, war governments, have both been in the service of the financial oligarchy, right? So this raises, once again, which has been a time one question of labor movements and left movements of independent politics. But of course, when one looks at the left, whether it's the soft left, if you call it the Democratic Party, which I don't really consider leftist, but that's another issue, or you talk about the, the far left, right? One of the things that stands out is an incredible sectarianism, right? And this seems to be the unavoidable and incurable disease of the left. All right. Thank you, Isaac. I'm sorry we ran out of time. We don't have any time for more questions, but you can perhaps keep your question for panel number two coming up. Huh? So please join me in thanking panel number one.